Well, after last lesson, when I tried so fiercely to explain about the law, um, I thought of a simpler way to say it, and so I wrote it down. Um, we don't follow the law. Okay. That was for Israel back then. We don't follow it today. Um, but we can still learn from the law. Because the whole Bible is from God and for us today. But that, but still, we don't follow the law. Okay? The law of God is written on our hearts. And we have the aid of the Holy Spirit. But we don't have to conform to some Old Testament law. We also do not have to earn our salvation. They didn't earn it back then, but we especially don't have to. We are not under the law, but we are under grace. I hope that that explained it. Why couldn't I have said it that, that way in the first place? I think sometimes I try to make things more complicated. This lesson is going to be a two-parter, two and we're going to talk about uh, the books of history. Now, if you remember last last video, we were talking about the books of the law. So we talked about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay. Today we're talking about the books of history. So these are the books um, that when you when, at, right after you finish finish Deuteronomy, you hit the books of history. It starts with Joshua and it doesn't end till Esther. Um, now, as far as when the books of history happen, there's actually quite a quite a broad um, time frame that they cover. They start in about 1400s or 1200s. Once again, it depends when the exodus of Israel from Egypt was. Um, and it could have been as early as the 1400s. It could, have, it could have been as late as the 1200s. So whenever that is, is going to change the date of when Joshua happened. Or I'm sorry, yeah, Joshua and Judges happened. Okay. Um, however, the last of the history books, um, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, those all happen, um, finish happening by about the 400s. Um, and then, um, and I'm going to say this again at, at the end of next video, but there's nothing in between um, um, where Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, that stuff ends. They, they have like, I think it's, um, they might have a few more prophets, if I remember correctly. But anyways, they just have a little bit left ha happening, and, and then there's this, this, there's this big quiet time. It's called the 400 years of silence. And what that means is that God didn't speak. There were no other, there, not that God didn't speak at all, but uh, necessarily, but that there's no recorded, um, there's no recorded prophets, no recorded uh, biblical um, books. That, that's, that's the 400 years of silence. The, the Old Testament ends, and there's 400 years until the New Testament begins. Okay? And Christians believe that nothing happened, that, that God didn't give a, 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 a written word um, past that. The last of the prophets, the last of the stuff in the Old Testament, that stuff happened, and then there was 400 years when, when God did not um, give and um, give uh, further revelation. Now, it's unclear as to whether God was still, I mean, God was probably still speaking to people who sought him, like, you know, how he speaks to people. Um, but there was no official, you know, no prophets, no official um, revelation from God. So, <clears throat> so the books of history are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Okay, um, a lot of different stuff happens during this. During Joshua, there's uh, um, Israel is going into the Promised Land. It picks up exactly where Deuteronomy left off. During Judges, they're in the Promised Land, but things aren't going so great for them. During Ruth, it's during the time of the Judges. During First and Second Samuel, the time of the Judges has come to an end and um, the kingdom is established in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. It covers um, what happens while Israel is a kingdom. It also uh, it also follows um, the breaking of the kingdom, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the fall of the kingdom, um, and then Ezra and Nehemiah pick up after the people have already been exiled from the Promised Land, and Esther is while they are in uh, exile. But Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and, Ezra and Nehemiah cover as the Israelites go back to the Promised Land. So I'll try to make this simple. So when you're reading the books of history, 
um, y you follow a little bit of a different kind of guideline than you did for the books of um, of the law. First off, you want to pay attention to details, both the specifics of the chapter that you're in and the and the paragraphs that you're in, and also the broader story. Um, and I'll give an example of this in just a second. But you really want to pay attention to the whole book. Pay attention to the to the to the what's happening in the story, like Genesis. You start reading about Abraham in chapter 12. Read the whole story of Abraham, and then you'll understand the individual stories of Abraham a little bit better. Um, but pay attention to the details in the parts that you're specifically reading, and and, and the whole is in the whole book, the whole story about the person you're talking about. Um, you know. The whole chapter, the whole paragraph, etc. Um, what people do when they read the Bible is, is they they separate some parts from other parts. Like for instance, in First Corinthians thirteen, it talks about um, love. You know what love is and and how you should be acting in love. But people don't understand that that is right in between um, where Paul is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So this tells us that he's telling us, you know, these are how you use the gifts of the Spirit, but you should always do anything you do in love. And then go, he goes back to talking about the gifts of the Spirit. So you see that love, how you do something, is also as important as what you are doing. Um, my, my pastor says it like this. When it's not just about having the words of the prophet, it's about having the heart of the prophet. And what that means is some people read through the prophets and they just, oh, they really let them have it. But they don't understand that the people were speaking in love and in compassion, not all out of irritation, just, oh, God's going to get you good. That's not the heart of a prophet. That's the heart of someone who wants to see destruction come on somebody. Think of it when a Christian will pray for somebody, but instead of praying, praying that God would draw them in, says something like this. Lord, I pray that you would convict them of their wrongdoing, that you would, that you would show them how wicked their ways are. Well, so you're not really praying for that person. You're returning a curse for a curse. See, that they have acted wrong to you, so you are now praying um, a wrong prayer to them. And you know it's wrong because it's not in line with God's kingdom. God desires for all to come to repentance. God's kindness leads us to repentance. See what I mean? It it's not all about judgment. Now we're gonna get more about this. We're gonna talk more about this when we get to the prophets. So just keep those things in mind. Don't separate parts of the Bible from the other parts of the Bible. Pay attention to the story. Pay attention to what's going on. Now obviously there's differences between the books themselves. Like Genesis is a, is a different part than Exodus. Even though I said Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are one unit. They are still five individual parts. I hope that that makes sense. You have to see that Genesis has different themes in it than Exodus does, and Leviticus has different themes in it than Exodus does. So, um, Also, keep in mind as you're reading stories that the Bible was not written with verse and chapter. There, well, there wasn't distinctions and, and, and separations like there are now. So when you're reading the Bible you are reading a, a broad story. What we do nowadays is when we when when we reach the end of a chapter, we just kind of, okay, new thought. But no, it's a continuing thought. It's the same book. See what I mean? Um, Genesis, just because you go from chapter 11 to chapter 12, doesn't mean that it doesn't have anything to do with it. It just means that it might be, maybe sometimes it is changing focus a little bit, but it is still a part of the whole. So, so realize, that, realize that the book is a whole not just parts. Also, when you're reading it, you can't always know that the Bible is condoning something just because a good guy did it, because the good guys don't always do something that's right. Uh, for instance, there's, there's a judge in the book of Judges whose name is Gideon. Now, God tells him to do these different things, and he repeatedly tests the Lord. He asks the Lord, okay, if this is your will, um, do this. If this is your will, do this. If this is your will, do this. That's not a good thing to do. In fact, the Bible says not to test the Lord. See, now God was merciful and gracious to, to Gideon, but that doesn't mean that God condoned or accepted or approved what Gideon did. Does that make sense? So just because the person is a good guy, quote-unquote, doesn't mean that they will um, always act in a way that's right. Okay? I hope that that kind of makes sense. Um, so here's an example. In the book of Judges, there's a prostitute 
who lives in the land of Canaan. And Israel comes over. This is once again, this is in the book of Joshua. The Israelites come over to conquer, and they get to a place called um, uh, Jericho. And uh, in Jericho, there's a, there's this prostitute Rahab who helps them to conquer Jericho. She hel she she protects the spies, and um, she actually is, sa is saves and is saved by the Israelites and joins the Israelites. And she's actually one of the ancestors of Jesus. So I mean, this is kind of a big deal, especially because she's an outsider. Okay. Now, it might seem like this is kind of out of nowhere until you realize that right around the same time, there's an Israelite who's doing something very wicked. Um, and so if you read the story by itself, you see, oh, there was this prostitute Rahab, and she was saved from Jericho when everybody else was killed. But if you read the whole story of what's going on, you see that there's a, there's a soldier in Israel who um, was fighting, and he stole something that God – or took something that God told him not to take. And he hid it underneath his tent. And so God punishes him for this. In fact, all of Israel loses a battle because of his sin. Um, and so God punishes for him for it, and he's killed. And then you start to realize that him and Rahab are contrasted. Okay, um, So Rahab, um, when, when the spies were sent to Jericho to spy on the land, Rahab hides them on her roof. Whereas the soldier from Israel hides the stuff that he had no right to under his tent. Whereas Rahab was not part of Israel, but was later included in Israel, the soldier was part of Israel and was excluded from Israel. See what I mean? Does that kind of does that kind of make sense? It's a contrast between the two characters. Um, and narrative oftentimes does that. Narrative means stories. When reading the books of history, you're reading these these historical narratives, these stories, these things that happened. And you have to pay attention to the whole like that, or else you're going to miss kind of the idea of what the author is saying, and you're going to start applying things falsely. I know a lot of people who take that thing that Gideon did that I was talking about from the book of Judges, and they try and follow the same thing. Lord, if this is your will, show me this, or do this, or, 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 or have this happen. When that's not according to, um, according to God's ways. So, <clears throat> that takes us to the first book of the books of history, which is Joshua. Um, now, uh, well, I'll get to it in a second. After Deuteronomy ends, Joshua is appointed uh, is appointed the new leader, and he leads the people into Israel. Okay, um, the book of Joshua was, was probably written for the most part by Joshua. Some, once again, sometimes between the 1400s and 1200s, pretty much picks up as soon as Deuteronomy ends. Um, and he leads a conquest of the land. Um, in, in Joshua that takes about seven years, although the book as a whole takes about 20 years to take. Everything in Joshua is about 20 years long. However, the conquest or the fighting part where they're, where they're taking over parts of the land is seven years. Now, in the book, um, now keep in mind, they don't conquer the whole land. Okay, That's actually going to be one of the things that comes up in, G in Judges. Um, now, this is how the, how the tribes were broken up. You see Judah down here. Here's Simeon. And Simeon, if you remember, um, well, I didn't actually get into that, but Simeon is excluded from the other tribes like this because he was a very because back when Simeon wasn't a tribe, it was a person. Um, he he slaughtered a town with his brother Levi um, because their sister had been raped, and so his father said, uh, kind of cursed him because of his his um, short temper, I guess you could say. I'm way oversimplifying this, but just roll with me on this. And so Simeon was to be excluded, or not excluded, excuse me, let me get my thing back, but separated from the rest of the tribes um, because of his of his anger. So then uh, here's Reuben down here, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan's over here, Manasseh's here, and Manasseh's also here. Okay? Notice how big Manasseh is. Once again, if you read the end of Genesis, you see that Manasseh gets um, gets a lot more than um, everyone else, the double blessed. Um, here's Gad, here's Issachar, sorry, here, here's Zebulun, here's Asher, and here's Naphtali. That's how they broke up the um, the tribes, uh, or the tribal allotments, as it's called. That's how they broke it up. Um, now, when they got into the Promised Land, there were these two mountains. Let me move my webcam out of the way here. There are these two mountains. Here's Mount Gerizim, and here's Mount Ebal. And the people recited the law. 
um, one side would say it while the other side agreed to it and so on and so forth. And this is what it, what it looked like here. So there's, there were some of the people here and there's some of the people here. And as they said the law, it actually echoed. It's like a giant theater. Um, and uh, I just thought that was very interesting. Um, as they got into the promised land, they were uh, st trying to start it off on the right foot. So um, that's that's pretty much all of Joshua. Um, it, history wise, it goes through the, their conquest there, but then it, it kind of trails off into the different uh, allotments. But w once again, it doesn't end with um, with uh, the whole land conquered. And so, excuse me. That takes us to the book of Judges, and um, after Joshua, the Israel, Israel just kind of gets into this place um, in their spiritual development where not a whole lot is happening. Um, they don't really have a a leader, so per, per se, but they have like some leaders, and it's just not really anything defined. Um, and Israel as a whole really isn't um, following God's laws which is going to be a factor throughout the book. But uh, we don't know exactly who wrote it. Anonymous, someone, maybe one of the prophets, I don't know. Um, so it, it, the events happened from as early as the 1400s to about 1050, when um, somewhere around there, um, where King Saul uh, becomes a king. So uh, what we see in Judges, though, is that we see people who, who, who God told them, trust me, okay, obey me, go and do what I'm calling you to do. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to cause this to happen. But yet in, in Judges, they didn't conquer. They, they hadn't conquered the land. Um, the, the Canaanites were still scattered throughout. The, the problems were still there. You know, it just actually got worse for them. Um, and then we find out throughout the process of reading the story that there were two reasons why – they did not um, conquer the land fully. The first reason was that they didn't trust God. Um, they uh, tried a whole bunch of different tactics, but they never tried trusting God. Um, and that's believing in him, but also persevering in believing in him. So they maybe had spurts of, of things every once in a while, but that's going to kind of be a theme for Israel. Um, and then the second reason was that they didn't obey God. They didn't obey the things that he told them to do. So as a result, he didn't... Um, he didn't. Uh, he kind of punished them for for that, if you will, and um, took away the blessings that he was giving and 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 allowing them the conquest. Now, if you remember, um, though, if you've ever read through the Old Testament, God said He wouldn't drive them out quickly. He said that He drive them out slowly so that the land wouldn't become. Um, well, He had His reasons, but not really important for the, what I'm talking about. So back to what I'm talking about. He was God was always planning on driving them out slowly. But Israel, I guess, got tired of waiting because they kind of just fell apart there after just a few generations. Um, but what happens is the Philistines, who are going to be a people group who conflict with um, Israel a lot, a lot they're going to conflict with Israel. They're going to be some of their worst enemies. Um, they come into this land right here on the tip. Here's here's Canaan, okay, which is later going to be Israel. Um they come in here, and they just kind of get rooted in there, and, and they stay there. Um, and this is during the 1200s. If they would have listened to God and obeyed her, his voice, they would have had a secure hold on the land, and the Philistines never would have been a problem for them because they would have already had control of the land. <laughs> See what I mean? Their, their disobedience got them where they missed out on what God had for them. So if you look on this map here, you can see all the different places Excuse me, that the um, judges came from. One came from here, 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 down here, over here, um, over here, over here, over here. You can just see just they came from everywhere. And what makes it even more complicated as to how long the book of Judges takes it takes is there may have been judges who were judging at the same time, like simultaneously, like just in different areas. And there also may have been breaks between some of the judges. That um, see what I mean? It's not really it, judges doesn't doesn't really break it up. Hey, this is history just for history's sake. It breaks it up. Hey, this is the important things to know, um, and why the land wasn't conquered, and how badly um, a righteous king is needed, which we see fulfilled in uh, Matthew. But then also we wait to see the full full fulfillment of that. 
Um, so one of the themes throughout J Judges is that morally and um, you know w with civil law, w with with religion and everything, it's just complete anarchy. There's just complete chaos. People are doing whatever they want. There's no set leader. There's no um, there's no heritage of of leadership like this person's son rules or no nothing like that. It's just kind of chaos. God raises certain judges for certain times, but you know ultimately there's no law, there's no God. Everybody's just doing whatever the heck they want. Um, and you see a lot of the things in Judges actually um, relate to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis. Um, a lot of the same things happen. Um, anyways, um, so as far as their enemies here, there were there are three that I want to bring up. This right here is called Ammon, or the Ammonites. And this right here is called Moab, or the Moabites. Now, if you remember Abraham, who was the, the forefather of Israel, okay, um, he had this relative named Lot. And Lot went and lived lived near a place called uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And there were two cities. Um, and they were extremely wicked, so God went to destroy them. But he saved Lot from the destruction. And Lot got really scared, so he moved up into the mountains and just kind of stayed there. Um, now his daughters got kind of, ugh, we're never going to be able to marry up here. So they get so they get Lot drunk, and both of them, in, on different nights, have sex with him. And so from that, they have they have children. Um, and one of them has a child who becomes the Ammonites. Excuse me. There. And the other one has a child who becomes the Moabites. Okay? Now, so what about Edom? Now, if you remember Jacob... Who was um, who would later be called Israel? Um, his name would be changed. He had a brother named Esau. Now the, I don't really want to get into it, but Esau gives up his birthright and um, loses out on a blessing from his father. Um, and so, long story short, he becomes Edom and moves over here. Excuse me, over here. And uh, Jacob. Uh, comes back, goes up to the land of Haran, but then comes back down and settles um, around this area here. Um, so he settles in here, and his brother um, Esau, who becomes Edom, is over here. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that that's kind of a big thing throughout the Bible. Those characters definitely do come into play. Um, so, no law, no God. So that takes us through pretty much all of Judges. It, it, you see, the same, it's the same thing. The people fall to sin. So then God brings judgment, then they cry out to God, so God brings a judge by, who then um, frees the people, and then they start this whole cycle over again. That's Judges in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell. So that takes us to the book of Ruth, which happens dear in the book of Judges. Um, actually, it starts out by saying this was when uh, Judges ruled, ruled over uh, Israel. Um, as far as who wrote it, nobody... Nobody knows, uh, just an anonymous author. We don't know the exact date, just that there was a famine, and so um, uh, a woman named Naomi moves with her family to Moab, which I just mentioned, um, right here on the, excuse me, right here. Uh, and they, her two sons marry, um, marry Moabites, and one of the Moabites who her son marries is called Ruth. Okay. Um, however, both the sons end up dying, and Naomi returns back to Israel, and Ruth goes with her. Um, Ruth is a little bit of a confusing story for a lot of people because they don't understand the idea of Israelite culture. So uh, I'll break up the things that are that are that are kind of important. First is the idea of a kinsman redeemer. Now. Your your inheritance would go through the males of the family, okay? And 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 uh, there was this idea that everything in the land God ultimately owned, um, and that He broke it up into tribes. So you could sell something of yours, but you could later redeem it. And um, every I think it was fifty years, um, the land would be returned to you. Uh, so you could sell your land, and somebody else could 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 purchase it and use it. But then at the end of that that fifty years, it'd be returned to your tribe. Okay, to your, according to who was left. and um, As far as if there were no descendants, it would go out to your nearest relative, male relative. Um, it would go out like that until they found the nearest rel relative. Um, and so what happens in Ruth is 
as Ruth and Naomi are living kind of poor, Ruth goes out to, to look for food to, to live off of, and she stumbles upon a man's field by the name of Boaz. Now, Boaz starts telling his servants to leave a little bit extra for Ruth um, while they're gathering up the grain and whatnot. So Ruth always has plenty, and so Naomi says, you know what, hey, what, you need to marry this guy. Um, and so she goes and asks, basically asks him to marry. It's a long story, but I don't really want to get into it. Um, and Boaz says, okay, this is what we got to do. We got to go find your nearest kinsman redeemer. And so he goes to him and he says, okay, do you want Naomi's land because her, her husband and her sons are all dead? And he says, yes, yes, I do want that. But then Boaz says, okay, but you have to marry Ruth and you have to provide for her children, which brings us this idea, Levirate marriage. I hope I'm saying that right. And the idea of this marriage was to preserve the family. If a woman died and and she didn't have any male children, um, or maybe any children at all, I don't remember exactly if it's just male or if it's any children at all, to carry on the name, um, the the brother had to marry and, have, and uh, produce a child from that woman. However, if there was no brother, it'd be the nearest uh, nearest um, family, according to the kinsman redeemer. So if this person that Boaz was talking to wanted to buy the field, Naomi's field, or uh, Naomi's land, or I guess we should say Naomi's husband's land, because he was the he it was his land. Naomi was just married to him. Um, <clears throat> Remember during this time that, that the men were kind of the – not really the idea of equality as we think of it now. Okay, I don't really want to get into that. We'll skip right past it. Um, and so in, 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 with this, he decides, oh, no, I don't want to do that anymore. And uh, so Boaz, uh, uh, Boaz gets to marry uh, Ruth. And the thing was if he would have married, married – um, if he would have went ahead and purchased the land – it would have been an investment. However, with the addition of Ruth, it would have actually taken away from his inheritance because um, he would have had to produce children for Ruth. Plus, he already had a wife and a, and a secure household, and he would have had to provide for Ruth and for her children and also would have had to provide for Naomi. So all of a sudden, this investment of land is now something that's going to cost him to do. And so he says, never mind, Boaz, you can have it. I don't want to. I don't want to fulfill that duty. So Boaz marries Ruth and produces a male child for for Ruth to carry on the name, and um, Boaz produces. I mean, uh, provides for Ruth and Naomi. Um, I hope I made that clear. If there aren't any, if there, if I didn't, just let me know and I'll and I'll answer it to the best of my ability. Um, and we're almost done for this lesson. Um, so that's the idea of kinsman redeemer. Um, that this person, Boaz, wasn't the, wasn't the closest relative that would be able to redeem um, the land for Naomi and uh, produce Ruth a child. Um, and then, okay, so. Um, and then um, this story seems like it's out of nowhere, but then we find out that Ruth is also one of the ancestors of Jesus. Well, David and then Jesus. Um so as far as when it was written, um, it happened during the Judges, but it probably – it was written sometime uh, after uh, King David um, when it became king. And the reason for that is because at the end it says – you know, goes down the, the, the um, family tree to David. Um, so if David wasn't a thing yet, you know, obviously. Um, so that takes us to the books of First and Second Samuel. Um, I'm going to stop this video here, and we will uh, pick up on First and Second Samuel in the next video.